Sirius seemed to have the both the biggest, the most extraordinary stories, but the most extraordinary untruths and, and falsehood and also just sheer propaganda. And as the war developed, social media was then being used by both sides and used by both sides to attack each other. To what extent did you use citizen journalism to guide your reporting or in your reporting when you reported on Syria from outside Syria versus when you reported um, from inside Syria's borders? I think we have to put what happened in Syria and the reporting on Syria into the context of the time when what was then known as the Arab Spring uh, unfolded, first of all, in Tunisia, then uh, spreading to Egypt, then to Syria, and then to, to Yemen, to Libya, and each took its own specific form. That period in late 2010, early 2011, coincided with the time of the growing space afforded by the rise of social media, and most in particular, Facebook and Twitter, that gave a platform for the young generation. When the, the revolution started, journalists like myself, and there were many journalists from around the world, we could rush to Tunis and to the towns in the interior. We could rush to Cairo and to, other, to Alexandria and to other places. But Syria kept the borders shut. So initially, not many journalists could get in. A handful got in, and they contacted some of these activists. But the outside world had to largely rely on young Syrians who literally were finding their voice. And it was absolutely electric that for the very first time, not only could they say something out loud, they could say it in the streets, and it could carry across the world. For, so us at the BBC as well, we, we were banned initially, so it started March of 2011. By September, because I was one of the BBC journalists who had been going to Damascus since 1994, I had very good contacts, and so when the Syrians decided, okay, under pressure, actually pressure from the Arab League, from the, from the UN and others, to President Assad saying, you've got to open up, you've to show that you are interested in reform, you've got to let journalists in. So I was the first BBC team which went in. And for me, it was my first big lesson in social media, about in depending on social media. So I'll, I'll tell you this story, which for me was a cautionary tale. So I knew this was going to be the first BBC trip inside Syria. I knew that we had to make impact. I knew we had to ask the tough questions. So when President Assad's advisor, Boutain al-Shaban, who I knew since 94 very well, she said, yes, Lise, I'll do an interview with you. We will do it live from Syrian television. Um, and so I thought, so I said to my, my colleagues, I said, we need the best story. We need the strongest story uh, to put to her. And we got the strongest story. Zainab al-Husni was the first woman to die in detention. Amnesty International took up her case and said the first woman, you know, the terrible, the President Assad's government is cracking down on the journalists. So Amnesty International took up her case and I'm pretty sure Human Rights Watch and others, because I was looking, again, I was trying to get the strongest case. I looked at the footage of Zainab al-Hasni being buried um, in Damascus. They had the family mourning, the whole story was there. So I went, did my interview with Buthein al-Shaban. You have always worked for women. You say you work for women's rights. What about Zainab al-Hasni? What about her? And she said, no, that's not true. And she defended, I pushed, and that was my interview. We finished uh, the interview. We finished our trip. I went back to Amman. We went through Jordan. I just happened to have the t television on, and it was on Syrian TV. And all of a sudden... Who comes on TV but Zainab al-Hasni, holding up her ID card. And I called my Syrian colleague. I said, there's Zainab al-Hasni. I thought she was, she was dead. And then I said, her mother identified her. Her mother had gone to the morgue uh, that had also been carried on social media, that when her daughter died in prison, she said, horror of horrors, she was asked to go to the morgue, actually to identify another body and found her own daughter's body. There she was on Syrian TV. So I said, what does the mother say? So we found out and the mother, the mother was called, the mother was showed the picture and the mother said, yes, that's my daughter. Here was a story, the strongest story possible on social media. 
uh, that's, that's where it first came out from. And the Syrian activist took up the case. She became a martyr. I saw on social media the funeral. I saw on social media that her mother had seen her, but she was alive. So very early on, this was by October 2011. So that was at the beginning of the Syrian COVID revolutionary uprising that I learned my lesson in terms of social media, citizen journalism, activists. It's very, very useful but you have to be cautious because whether you call them citizen journalists or activists, those who pick up a camera or a telephone and send a message, yes, they're doing the job of journalists and sending information, but they have a mission. They have a, an objective and they have a side. So they can provide journalists, let us call us mainstream journalists or journalists who are trying to cover the entirety of the story. They give us, some information, and sometimes it could be a great deal of information, depending on what story you're covering, but it cannot give you the full story. And we still have to go back to the fundamentals of journalism, which I think to this day, they still teach in journalism school, and that's the five W's, the who, what, when, where, and why. Where do you think that you went wrong with getting all this information? Because if you see it um, multiple times on social media and you get the mother saying that she's identified, her daughter. I ask you, what better verification than a mother saying that's my daughter? That's my daughter in the morgue. Can you tell me whether there is any, bet, whatever era of journalism we're living in? That, that story seemed so watertight. And as I mentioned, I felt under pressure being the first BBC team going in, knowing we were going to be watched to see how we report. And it's not that I was doing anything extra. I was doing my job as a journalist. I needed the strongest story. So Amnesty, so I went to what I regarded as the world's best human rights organizations, to Amnesty International, to Human Rights Watch, International. There was another group that, that took it up. There was a funeral for her. So that may be, that's almost the case that that's, it's that you cannot contradict at all. You can't fault yourself because all the boxes, the boxes were ticked. You've covered conflicts around the world. Do you think that, um, and, and you've been inside conflict zones around the world, when you were inside Syria, did your reliance on citizen journalism shift in a way that was different from, um, from other countries that you covered? Um, and if so, how? Syrian citizen journalists and activists were both um, a, a bigger, uh, they offered greater potential and greater peril than any of the other Arab uprisings, simply because it was so difficult to get there. And even when you got to Syria, if you were on the side, if you got visas like we did to go into areas controlled by the government, you were still under a lot of surveillance. Often we traveled with minders and you would be entering areas where in homes, for example, uh, 2011, 2000, 2015, that they were, uh, they were divided. So you were on the government side and you needed to talk to people, for example, in the old city of Homs, which was besieged by government forces and the opposition, the activists were in there. So we couldn't get in and they couldn't get out and so we needed to talk to them. And in the early years of the, of the uprising in Syria, when it was still safe for us, we would talk to the citizen journalists in, inside to try to escape our minders and cross lines. That became too dangerous later on. Uh, but in the early years, it, it, was, it was possible to do. So for the journalists who went in on the government side, you needed to be able to access the areas which were not under the government's control and where the protests were continuing. You also needed to be able to talk to opposite, find out from opposition activists in the government held areas who were underground and were operating secretly. And similarly, the journalists who went in with the rebel forces, they needed to, depending on who they went in with, some people went in with, with uh, civilian activists, some people went in with more military forces, but either way, you needed to be able to, sometimes you were confined uh, because of the risks of bombardment. In order to expand your vision, if you like, and the depth of your reporting, you needed to be able to follow, either follow them on social media and then 
try to then direct message them or or talk to them directly once you've once you identified them and so they became a valuable a really really valuable resource but so they became really really a really important source of information but they also provided and increasingly so as the war went on an increasing source of risk. So if you take Aleppo, 2015-2016, where the Syrian government, backed by the Russian air power, Iranian support on the ground, were, were really pulverizing the parts of East Aleppo that were under that were under the control of the opposition groups. Well, there were citizen journalists operating there. Some of them were almost like correspondents for some of the Western networks. But they were giving us part of the story, but they weren't able to report, and some of them didn't want to report, the excesses of some of the more extremist groups which were operating in East Aleppo. So yes, they told us about the humanitarian hardship. Yes, they told us about the damage of the bombardment. All of that was true, but they didn't tell the full story because they couldn't, because their own lives would have been at risk. The, the, other, the other angle which is really important to bear in mind is that you know, I would say myself as a journalist working for a big broadcaster, and I've often said this when reporting on, you know, how we cover wars, I always say that no matter how complicated and complex a political situation is, a war, a conflict, that if you drill down, it's essentially a human story. It's a story of mothers, fathers, children, streets, neighborhoods, societies, writ large. It's a human story. And I think that that's what our readers, our, our listeners, our viewers are mainly interested in. But in focusing on the human story, and often those human stories came from activists, what was stripped away was the increasingly complicated and worrying politics of it, which was that what had begun as a largely peaceful civilian protest movement were year on year becoming a more uh, a panoply of different armed groups, increasingly Islamist and increasingly funded by an array of Arab states whose only desire was to get rid of Assad, whatever it took. You mentioned that you, you feel like uh, people sometimes lost the larger picture of um, the very intricate politics um, involved. Do you think that that was, that was because of the situation in which there was a lot of news coming out via social media, but it was difficult to get in or have access once you were in? I think it's not a problem of social media. I think it's a, it's a problem. It's not a problem. It, I think it's the character of journalism. I think that, you know, if you think for, you know, think about your mother, your best friend, your cousins, your your friend at school, I mean... What's the story they're going to read? You know, if you go into all those intricacies, you know, nobody's going to read it. But if you tell a strong story about a mother racing to the hospital who comes under bombardment and that someone who comes to save her is also the human story. And I think, you know, as I said to you, I think even as a, um, a journalist who covers a lot of the politics, the way to drive home to people around the world, especially in what is at that time an increasingly fractured media landscape where we're actually telling, having to tell people, this matters, stop. Don't swipe your phone, don't click on another one, don't turn the page, listen, this really matters. So you wanna tell them a story about Amina or Abdullah or something, and it's not simply a technique. It is at the end of the day, you know, why I always see our job in journalists is to try to narrow the gaps, not to say, Ooh, look at these people over there. They're fighting this war. They're so different from us. No, they're the same as you and I. And so the story of the children, the families, the students who are have robbed of their university, their chances to go to university, those are the stories that make people listen, stop people's hearts, and make people want things to change. Talk to their MP, their congressperson, go out in the streets and protest, get angry about international humanitarian law. That's why we go into journalism. We like to say, well, let's try to write something, say something, do something that makes people stop, makes them cry, makes them laugh. But our job also is to provide understanding and context for why it happens. So if you look at some of the best journalism, it's threaded the politics and the 
the tougher stuff to understand, you know, the real, the you know, sort of the more factual grit of the story is woven, woven, woven through it. But the stories in Syria were sometimes so horrendous, so compelling that they crowded out lots of other stuff. So it's not a problem just of social media. It's a problem also of journalism. But the social media problem is, is you could have an activist inside uh, East Aleppo who could call you up and say, look at this story. Isn't it terrible? What happened? And they will tell you what happened to the family, but they won't tell you that actually, you know, that there was weapons in the house, which was bombed or that there'd been a, um, some fighting going on nearby, they will not include, maybe they don't know all the details, but they may not include them, A, because it puts themselves at risk, and B, because that may also make you not want to tell the story in the same way. So again, you know, underlining the difference between being a journalist, trained professional journalist, and someone who was conveying crucial information, and sometimes just more than information, a sense of what was happening, an interpretation of what was happening, which is also crucial, uh, that, you know, with the two of them combined together, it was a powerful combination. Uh, each on their own, we're, 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 not, we're not as, something was missing. Is there anything that, that you would like to add? The other thing I'd like to add about Syria is, after the years of working in Syria, I began to think that of all places I worked, that Syria was one of the most difficult to get at the truth. Starting with the stories I told you about Zainab al-Hasni, but you also had in Syria, in a way you hadn't had in other places, and bear in mind that we're talking 2011, this was the beginning of the internet and of social media, and a time where we can look back at nostalgia and think, that we thought of the of social media, Twitter, Facebook, as these, with the dazzling power to bring the world together, to expand our information and horizons. But it always happened that whenever the greatest tests of truth in, in, in journalism, they often came in Syria. Syria seemed to have the both, the biggest, the most extraordinary stories but the most extraordinary untruths and, and falsehood and also just sheer propaganda. And as the war developed, social media was then being used by both sides. They say Vietnam War was the first television war. So Syria was the first social media war. Social media has been so amazing for, for journalism. It's transformed it. But, you know, as I mentioned, it also has meant we also have to just keep to um, remind us to keep keep to our to to what we know as well to, to what we're what our profession mm -hmm. is rooted in as well